We're going to observe the Lord's Supper and we'll look, look at a passage of scripture to guide our thinking as we participate. And if you don't have a Bible, raise your hand and a, a man will be glad to put one into your hand. And if you don't have a Bible, this is your, a gift to you. This morning we're going to be reading and meditating on 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. This passage uh, containing this verse, uh, it, it really centers around Jesus after he had completed his time here on the earth and he was back with his Father in glory. But the verse that we're going to look at centers on what he did when he was here on earth, the, the, the really the central thing that he did while he was in his flesh here on the earth. And in order to get the context, I will read uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting at verse 17, and I'll read through 21. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away, and, things, and new things have come. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are amb ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Will we begin looking at the first part of verse 21? It tells us that God made the one who did not know sin to be sin. In the book of Hebrews, we learn that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. In fact, he's the exact representation of his nature. Jesus is equal to God the Father in essence. And although as a man, uh, Jesus was tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin, Jesus has never experienced sin. Before he came to earth, and all through his earthly existence, he did not experience sin. He was, uh, I, want to, I want us to consider the depths to which a, a person like this, a, a sinless person, the God man, the depths to which he humbled himself and stooped when, it, in, when he became a man and what he did here on the earth. And this is found in Philippians. I'll just read the, the verses here. Although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard, regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Jesus laid aside the prerogatives of a, as being the Son of God in order to accomplish what the Father had appointed him to do. What does it mean that God made the Son to be sin? Murray Harris in his commentary says that God caused Christ to be identified in some way with what was foreign to his experience, namely human sin. The meaning here is not that God made the, uh, him into sin, but that God caused the sinless one to be sin. Jesus did not become a sinner, but he was treated as though he were a sinner. He experienced all the wrath of God upon all the sins of all those who would believe upon him in the three hours that he hung upon the cross. The righteous ones suffered for the unrighteous ones. You and I had no righteousness which would commend us to, to God. There's none righteous, not even one, the Bible tells us. This verse points to divine initiative. It was God that made him to be sin. Isaiah prophesied this hundreds of years before Christ came. 
that, and, and it's written as though it happened and yet it's future. He says, but the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. Jesus was not an unwilling victim. He was determined to go to Jerusalem to do the Father's will. Jesus went through this suffering on our behalf. What he did becoming sin for us, what did it accomplish for us? The last part of verse 21 tells us that it was so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Just as the sin which he became was foreign to Jesus, the righteousness that which we become is foreign to us. It's not ours. It's the righteousness of God in him, only in him. And it is only in Christ that we become righteous. Not, uh, it's not a righteousness of our condition. It's a righteousness of our standing before God. Just as God imputed our sin to Jesus in order to, for him to pay the full penalty of our sin, God imputes the righteousness of his son to us. In Christ, our sins are forgiven and we stand counted righteous in the sight of God. God has purposed to make us into the likeness of his son. And when, when he brings us unto faith in his son, he creates a new nature within us. But we are not immediately as fully into that likeness as we will be. So it's after a lifetime of being transformed into his image that finally God will bring us into the likeness of his son when we actually see his son. But this is, the, this is complete sanctification. This is, this is, but when we talk about justification, we're not talking about sanctification. Sanctification is not complete in this life. It's progressive. Justification is completed when we believe. You are standing as perfect before God when you believe on his son as you will ever be. And this is, this is immediate. It's, it's at the point of faith in his son that we become righteous in God's sight. It's an imputed righteousness. It's a, it's a forensic term. It's a legal term that we are now standing before him as righteous. As, as, it's a great exchange that took place there. Our sin placed on him, his righteousness placed on us when we believe. You might summarize this verse in the following way. In the three hours that Jesus hung up on the cross, he paid the full penalty of God's wrath upon the sins of all who would believe in him. It's a penalty that we could never pay even if we had to experience the results of it, which would be forever in the lake of fire, it would never be paid. It would go on forever. But, and he did this that he might impute to us a righteousness of God, a righteousness that we could never have produced, and it becomes ours forever through faith in Christ. Christian, as you partake of the Lord's Supper, you can do so with joy as Isaiah expressed in Isaiah 61.10, I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with the garment of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom checks, uh, decks himself with a garland, as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. If there's someone here who has never come to faith in Christ, we ask that you not participate in the Lord's Supper. The, the, the Lord ordained this practice for those who love him and follow him, who believe in him. But we ask that, that you, you consider that this is God's only way of salvation. And I, just think about what, why, why, did, why did Christ have to suffer so much? Why would the father who loved his son put his son through the grief of agony of being separated from him? First time he's ever had a separation with his father ever. And it was a thing that he dreaded before he went to the cross. It was 
but he came willingly to do that for the sins of man. Well, it's, it's the reason that he did this is because it shows the terribleness of our sin in God's sight. He would have never done this had it not been the only way that he could make atonement for human sin. This is the only way that God has to bring people into salvation, into his relationship with him. We would urge you, if you do not know him, to visit with someone here. After the service, there will be someone up here at the corner of our auditorium that would be glad to pray with you, to, to talk with you. Uh, you can talk with anyone here that, uh, that you know that might be able to talk. We have plenty of people here that could talk with you about that. Gentlemen, come and service, and after a time of meditation and heart searching, you may take per, uh, communion on your own. <clears throat>